Hello there. Welcome to the Happy Even After podcast. I am here with my friend Karina Moss today. And Karina has a really special story. Um, it's one from, uh, it's a divorce story, but it's also a writer's story. And as a fellow writer, this one really just kind of hits me um, right in my heart and gives me all the good feels. So Karina was divorced four years ago, but at a time when most people are just so overwhelmed and they find it so uncertain, she decided to make another major huge life decision and that was to become a full-time writer. And it paid off because Karina has recently signed with a major publishing house and has a three book deal and all kinds of exciting stuff that comes from that. Um, but it was a huge risk because the writing world, if anyone knows about it, is uncertain and the financial, um, the security of it is uncertain. So welcome, Karina, and thank you for being here. Thanks. Hi, Renee. So let's first talk about your divorce. We're going to talk about your divorce today and talk about your writing journey um, because you and I have kind of been on a similar journey at the same time. Um, so I'm really excited to just talk about something that's so dear to me as well. So can you just share your divorce journey with us? Sure. Um, so I was married 25 years and um, the divorce was, you know, in hindsight, not a surprise, but at the time it was for me. And so um, uh, we got we separated and um we're we're friendly um he's a great guy and there was no you know huge blow up or anything um we have a son who we share custody of and he has um some special needs issues he has ADD and he's on the spectrum and so um we were uh we decided to share custody 50 50 and um that you know sometimes you don't realize how much stress you're under until you're not under it anymore and so i was a stay-at-home mom and so i had felt at the time that that was my responsibility you know being the the parent i mean he you know my ex-husband he's an excellent parent and um, but I just felt that that was my responsibility entirely. And so I took it all on. And so I didn't leave myself much of anything else for myself. And, um, and I think a lot of women can relate to that when you just get, you just put everybody else first. And then when I got divorced, um, there was, you know, out of default, there's nobody else to put first. So most, you know, I mean, of course, my son still comes first, but he's a teenager now. And so, um, and he's become very independent and doing very well. So um, uh, we, um, uh, what was I going to say? So um, I had a little more time to think about myself for once and um so I did and I thought well what do I want to do now I had a little bit of time because of um child support I was still I, I have a part-time job um and then I also take care of my son and so um I just felt like I could spend the time you know, being sad, which I was, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel like I needed to figure out what happened in order to move forward because mm -hmm. I didn't know how long that was going to take to, to, um, to say, you know, oh, I, I should have done this, or if only he had done that, or I wish this had happened, you know, instead of like going back to what was i kind of just accepted the reality of my life and where it was at and decided to move forward on that and the, one of the big reasons was when i um got my own place i three weeks later i turned 50 and so that was a huge transition regard whether you're married or not whatever you're going divorce or not that was right. huge too so i was going through two major transitions mm -hmm. and 
I just felt like I don't have time. I don't have time to sit and, and, and just be sad, you know, I mean, that that's, you're going to be sad anyway, you know, right. and so, and I don't, for me, I don't believe that time alone heals things. I, I feel like what you do with your time mm-hmm. will help you to heal. Um, but I don't think that um, just looking back, for me, that wasn't the way to go, because you just don't get out of the situation. And so that's why I move forward. And that's so interesting because I think it's so important to allow yourself that time to grieve and be sad. But then at some yes. point, you have to pick yourself up and take steps because otherwise you kind of get stuck. And then I think that's the problem. Yes. That's where people get hung up is that they're, yes. they're not doing anything but being sad and grieving. Right. And yeah, and you do, and you bring up a good point is that you absolutely, you can't, okay, I'm going to, that. that's why, um, many of my friends had said, um, well, get back out there and date and da, 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 right, you know, right away. And I didn't want to, you know, in my head, it's like, you have this picture, um, you know, at my age, you might, I don't know if you remember them, like, um, paper dolls, you know? And so you have, you know, the mother and the father and the child. And I didn't want to just cut out my ex-husband and put somebody else in and keep that life I had, you know, because that obviously didn't work for me. You know, if it had worked for me, we'd still be married, you know? And so, you know, regardless that it wasn't completely my choice and looking back, you see how you contributed and how, if you were happy too, if you were both happy, it, you know, it would have worked out. And so, um, for me, I didn't want to just, um, replace him with someone else and lead that same life. And so, and I, and, and, you know, so I don't believe in just ignoring your feelings. Certainly you have to, but I feel like if you accept the reality, you almost accept the feelings more when you are just grieving, you often are grieving for so long and sad for so long because you're, you're in the would have, should have, could have phase. Mm-hmm. And you're constantly kind of trying to figure out and trying to make it better in your mind, trying to like rewrite your story and to what you would rather it have been. And I think that's a lot of the grieving. I don't even think it's our feelings. I think it's, we're, we're fighting against the reality of, of what's happened. So I think when you accept, at least for me, that was like my mantra every morning, accept. I would cry, I would whatever, but when you just accept it and you cry, whatever, there's nothing to go around in your head. You're just, you just feel the feelings. There's no, you're not fighting them. So you cry for 20 minutes and then you get on with your day, you know, right. and, and, and so it's different. So you're able to kind of move on and believe, I mean, I did that for two years. It wasn't like I was like, oh, okay. You know, I right. mean, it, it's a process. It's definitely a, a process, but um but I feel like when you accept it's you move out of that process and, and able to think of yourself and be someone who you might not have been. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that there's so much growth from pain, I think, you know, and it very forces much. you to become someone that you didn't think you were capable of in the best way possible. You that's know? one of the things. Definitely. I, I am, you know, if you asked me, what did you learn? That is my major thing was I'm more capable than I thought I was, than I give myself credit for. Um, Because looking back, I was very capable. I advocated for my son for years for school. And so that he's the, you know, uh, he's lived up to his potential. Um, So I was capable, but I just didn't give myself credit for it. And when you're kind of on your own and you have to have a little more confidence and you have to push yourself, you can't kind of hide behind anybody or even use any, you know, even when people would say that about my son, I'd always kind of push him in the front and be like, no, no, it's him. It's all him. And of course, you know, it is him, but I, you know, when the wind beneath your wings kind of thing, that's who Mm -hmm. I kind of was. And it was only when you're by yourself you know, it's kind of cliche, but it's true. You, you find out who you are and grab, you know, embrace that, like be okay with that. And, and part of the issue in the beginning for me was that 
you know, people, a lot of people would say, oh, well, look what you're doing now. Look where, you know, when, when I got my agent a couple of years later, it was like, well, oh, look now. And you, that wouldn't have happened if you were still married. And for me, that made me feel almost guilty for mm. doing well, because it almost made me feel like, oh, well, but this wouldn't have been my choice. I mean, you know, to, to break up your family, there's so much shame and so much heartache right. around that. And so in the beginning, when people would kind of couch it like that, it would make me, um, you know, subconsciously kind of self-sabotage in a way and, mm -hmm. and wonder if I should be doing this because should I be feeling good about the choices that I make now that I wouldn't have made then and the wow. things that are happening now that truly wouldn't have happened then, you know, when, if I was married still. And what I decided was that, um, you know, a lot of times just for fun at, at any point in your life, you're like, oh, if you didn't do this, what would you be? If you weren't, mm -hmm. you know, if you weren't a, an attorney, what would you be? Whatever. And so you kind of like, you know, kid about this parallel life or what would you do? And I finally looked at it as I'm getting to lead my parallel life, you know, right. that, and because again, accept the reality is this has happened. It's not just because I accept it doesn't mean uh, that I wanted it, that um, in the beginning that I was okay with it, all of those things, mm. because a lot of that comes along with it, all of the forgiveness for yourself and, and um, for your spouse, a lot of that, when you do that, it feels um, like you're saying it's okay. And you don't want to say that. So you kind of hold on to those things. But when you, if you kind of just accept things, then it has to be okay because it is. Right. And so then you can embrace that parallel life. And for me, I thought, well, okay, then I'm not married anymore. That sucks. So what would I do if I wasn't <laughs> married? You know, I, that's what I said. What would I do if I wasn't married? And <clears throat> for me, the, what I always wanted to do was be a writer. And so I thought, okay, um, you know, if I'm not going to do it now, I'm never going to do it, you right. know? So I just, and I'm not really a big risk taker. I, I actually um, think things through an awful lot, but it was something that I've always wanted. And I thought, you know what? I played it safe for a very long time. I'm the kind of person who has every kind of insurance you could possibly have. I play <laughs> it very safe and look where it's gotten me. It's to an unsafe place. So playing it safe doesn't always get you where you want to be. And so I thought, the heck with it. I'm just going to go for it. And I knew that I would never regret going for it no matter what, mm -hmm. because I needed to look back and say, I put 100% in it. Because even though I've always wanted to be a writer, and I've had a few small successes along the way, very small. Um, I never put a hundred percent in the beginning in my early 20s I did but I had no idea what I was doing and then you know I got married and then you know uh we had a child and then everything else takes precedence so right. it was more like oh wouldn't it be fun if I got published wouldn't it be fun rather than I'm putting my all into this you know and so I thought I will never regret putting everything I have into this no matter how it how it goes isn't that, you said something so interesting, and isn't it kind of a shame that we tend to, like you talked about, we get married, we have kids, we have a life, and those things that you've always wanted to do just fall away, like those selfish yes. desires, those self, because that's what you think. I that's think, what like, you we're, think. We're ingrained to think it's being, if we're going to take all of that time to write a book, which takes a lot of time, that's yeah. time away from your family and from your child. Yes. And that's selfish. Yes, know? exactly. And a lot of things that I had to do too, in order to be within the writing community and learn things that you need to learn, because as you know, it's a lot more than just sitting by yourself and writing a book. There's more to actually then getting published. Um, is th those things like, go, you know, going to a conference or spending money on an editor to see where you're at, things like that, I would have just, again, selfish, you know, and just the mm -hmm. time it takes, like you said, very selfish. A lot of time, I'm more creative in the evening. So um, I would, um, you know, go upstairs to my room and sometimes, you know, I would write and, you know, my son would come up or even, you know, my husband at the time, he'd turn on the TV, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, 
you know, I could have just said, oh, I'm writing or I could have moved or whatever. But I, I remember consciously thinking, oh, you know what? I, you know, they're here. And who am I to like walk away? And even when my son was uh, a baby, I was in the middle of writing um, a television movie screenplay. And um, I would kind of start resenting when he would wake up from nap because uh -huh. I would be in the middle of it. And after a while, I was like, you know what? And I, we adopted our son. And so it took a long time to get him. And I thought, I took too long to get this child. I don't want to feel this way. And mm -hmm. I'll get back to writing when he goes to school. You know, he's going to be in preschool in four years, uh, you know, a half day. I can write then. And so I, I actually put my writing aside while he was a baby and a toddler. And then, you know, as life would have it, uh, we didn't realize till he was in school that there were some other issues. And then there was, you know, very, very little time to write. But it did always even as he got older and, and more independent and I was had the time, like you said, I felt too selfish to take it. I just yeah. didn't feel like, and it, and it wasn't bringing in money, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just felt like I'm not going to spend money on it. I'm not going to go to a, a conference. I'm not going to hire an editor. I'm not going to, you know, do any of those things mm -hmm. um, besides, you know, taking the time to actually do it um, because my role was a mom, you know, right. and a wife. and you know, I think a lot of women feel that way. I think you're right. And I think that it takes, unfortunately, something like a divorce to kind mm -hmm. of awaken their prior love or passion for something that they had that they let fall yes. apart, which is sad because imagine what could happen if they were pursuing this through their marriage, you know? And That's very true. I, it, it's, I, I would have been a happier person. I would have been more fulfilled. My mm -hmm. ex-husband was always supportive of it. He didn't really understand what I needed to do to get there, but you can't really expect someone who's not a writer to understand. Right. But, um, but he was supportive. He was never, he never poo-pooed it. He never, he mm -hmm. wanted me to have that success and be driven that way. And it was totally me who um, put it, kept putting it to the side and pushing everybody in mm -hmm. front of me. And yes, I mean, if I had just set, taken that time and that and kept that passion, because when you meet someone, when you meet, end up meeting your spouse, that's who you are and that's right. who they fall in love with. Yeah. And then all those things go away, which is too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And you just wonder like how many marriages might have been saved if, if the one side or both were fulfilled doing yes. individual things. You know, I think there's so much resentment that builds up because of not taking care of ourselves or, you know, someone yes. just not pursuing something that they really love. And no one is ever going to say, oh, this is more important than raising a child because that doesn't, you know, of course it's not, but it's right. just that, that guilt and that, right. you know, that you right. have from. And you shouldn't have to look at it as a as as more important than I mean right. I look back now and I realize okay I'm doing it all now I mean you do it when right. when you choose to do something you find a way to do it and yeah. so it, it wasn't more important and I and I if I had in my head had that perspective that my passions and um my happiness is is just as important because it's not just for me. It's for the whole family. Right. You know, when I'm important, when I'm happy, when he, when my ex-husband's happy, when our son is happy, you know, everybody's happy when we're each happy. Right. And so, and that's what happens. Yeah. And you kind of put yourself over my, my ex-husband um, is a professor. He got a PhD. So for years it was okay. I, you know, supporting him through his PhD and then supporting him through tenure. And then, and, but because his was something, okay, in four years, I'm getting this. Okay, in seven years, I'm getting mm -hmm. this. Whereas me, a writer, who knows when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. And it's so, you know, writing is another whole thing, but it can <laughs> be applied to anything. So let's talk about that because I know that there are listeners out there and I've been contacted by numerous women who have said, like, I always wanted to write, I want to write a book or I have a manuscript. Let's talk about the writing journey overall, because I think it's mm. kind of like this unknown. And unless you're really like in it and making a lot of mistakes, you're not, it, it's really hard to know how the whole process works. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your journey. 
Okay, yeah. So my journey is a lifetime journey. And so if you can avoid that, go ahead. But, um, <laughs> but no, it, um, so yeah, I mean, it's all just a matter. I didn't go to school for it. You don't have mm -hmm. to go to school for it. You just, you know, have to have a passion for it and, and learn. I mean, and you right. can learn all kinds of ways, you know, you can books, you could take classes. There's a lot of online kind of things you could pay, you know, pay $20, $50, whatever for. So you don't need, you know, a lot of money to even learn the craft. Um, so with me, I just kept writing because I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, I, like I said, I had gotten little things along the way. I won a Connecticut short story writing contest that the Hartford Current had, um, promoted. And, um, from that, I ended up writing a short ballet that ended up being, um, performed at the Bushnell Theater, uh, with the Nutcracker. Uh, over because it was a Christmas ballet and um, my first short story that I got published was in Chicken Soup for the Kid's Soul oh, way nice. back when yeah so little things like that so I, I just kept writing what I like to write you know I what and what I like to read was mysteries and so mm -hmm. I was writing mysteries and um then and sending them off back then when I started writing there was a lot of publishing houses where you didn't need an agent to send your submission and so I did that and you know I would get the basic one line you know this isn't right for us kind right. of line and then after a few years and I would write one and I'd start another one by the time this was back in the old days when you actually had to mail them <laughs> um, and so I by the time I got the old one back and looked through it I saw oh my god I can't believe I sent that out kind of right. thing so I was getting better as I was going. And that's really the only way to do it is just keep writing, keep writing, whether it's short stories or um, a book, you just write and that will, you know, uh, improve you. So, um, so I did that. And then I started getting a little better rejections, which is funny to <laughs> say, you know, the irony of that, but true because they would start telling me what they liked about it and right. what was wrong with it. And so they actually read enough of it to, you know, see mm -hmm. that. So then I realized that I was getting, okay, I'm getting a little better. So the, the turning point was when I actually went and met a few published authors in my field. They were giving a talk at a library and I was able to ask them some questions and mystery writers overall, because I belong, you do as well, to mm -hmm. um, Sisters in Crime, they, mystery writers are so uh, welcoming and mm -hmm. inclusive, and um, there's no, I haven't felt anyway, competition, especially with women mystery writers, yeah. and so um, they were not only wonderful that night, but kept in touch with me, and um, so I learned um, a lot about my genre. And so if you're going to write fiction and you want to write specific, I specifically write cozy mysteries, um, that you, you do kind of need to know, uh, what's going to sell. And, um, so I learned more about what to put in my books. And then, um, so I was still kind of just writing. And then, um, I, I separated from my husband and that's when I decided, okay, let me give this a hundred percent. And so I, I finished writing, I kept sending out things and I kept getting asked for uh, full manuscripts, which uh, as you know, is a good sign, mm -hmm. but ultimately they'd always say, ah, oh, still I can't put my finger on it. Not quite right. And so I came to a time where I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'm just not quite good enough. You know, I, and that I would say is a fallacy. No, but mm -hmm. everybody's writing style is different. There is no good enough. Right. What it was is that I, there were some parts to a, a book that um, you can do better and you can learn more. And so I hired a freelance editor that I found through one of my author friends who uses her. And that made all the difference. Her name is Barb Goffman. And she, um, she, it was like taking a master class yeah. in mystery writing, um, just for personally for me. So she made all the suggestions and you still have to make them. A lot of people think editors actually do things to your book. They don't, they don't touch right. your, your writing at all. Um, what they do is they make suggestions for what's wrong and they tell mm -hmm. you what's wrong and you know, what might not should be here, whatever. And so, um, I got it back and she also gave me a lot of confidence too. She said, I think this is one of the best mysteries I've ever read. And no. I, and I think you, you know, you've got this and it came at the right point in my life mm -hmm. because 
if it, depending on what this one person, even though I didn't know her, I, depending on this, what she said, I, I was really, it was going to be, okay, obviously I don't know what I'm doing or, okay, I'm going to still keep going on this. And so it was that I'm still going to keep going. So I did. And then I, I fixed it and it gave me the confidence to know, okay, I don't have to keep changing it. I can mm -hmm. still do this. And so I, um, sent it off to queried some more agents and still I got like three rejections back and I thought, okay, now something else has to change too. Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm confident in this. I'm, I'm, and that's a big thing too. Once you get confident in your work, you realize, okay, I'm not going to rely on their opinion. Obviously I'm not getting it to the right person. It's right. It's just right. not to the right person. Mm -hmm. So I went, uh, that's when I joined Twitter, um, being, an old broad. I, you know, <laughs> I was on Facebook. I didn't really know Twitter, but I had kept hearing that agents were on Twitter and you could actually like, yeah. you know, not, not really talk one-on-one, -on -one, but sometimes they would uh, tell you things that they were looking for or give you tips or things like that. And so I went on and a week later they were doing this pit mad thing where you pitched um, your book and agents would look through and if they liked them, they would ask you to send your thing. And I thought, well, that's a better way to get one. So I, but I, when I saw it, it was the day of the, of the pitch party, they call it. And I thought, oh, I, I have to have a pitch. So I wrote one in like 20 minutes and threw it out there. And I got several um, agents interested. And at the same time, um, this website called Savvy Authors was having a different kind of pitch party where they already had uh, agents and small publishers lined up and um you could pitch it to specific agents and so they didn't you didn't have to worry about an agent actually looking through and finding yours they they read every one so i did that as well and that's ultimately where i um found my agent i, I ended up getting three offers of representation from all of that from you know years of you know those couple of years of getting um and all the you know, if you count all of the years and other books of getting, you know, no, 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 mm -hmm. end up getting three. And it just goes to show you need, you just need the right eyes on it. It's not always whether you're good enough. So, yeah. you know, it, you know, it, it's important to look in yourself and keep improving and always mm -hmm. improving, but there's not a level where you have to reach and be like, okay, now I'm good enough. There is not. Right. Even, and you have to be flexible too, right? Because you can't just say my manuscript's done. I'm not changing it. This is my creation. This is my art. <laughs> you know, that's like right. the kiss of death. That's the very the kiss of death. <laughs> yes. You have to be willing to take criticism and decide who, you, you know, I, I know a lot of people have beta readers and I'm sure they're, they're invaluable for some people. I have never had one. Um, because I, I, I feel like, especially in the beginning, you need to be confident in your own voice and right. not hear from so many other people. Because a lot of times, what other people who are in, in, in the same position as you and maybe don't know any more than you, you're just getting a different opinion rather than maybe the right opinion. You know, right, I mean, right. it all. I, and so I think it's very important for you to listen to yourself and then also listen to uh, you know, people in the business a little bit more sometimes because they know like what sells and they know, um, what makes a good book. And it's right. not just, you know, what sells is what makes a good book and what makes a good book is what sells. So it's not, a lot of people also want to kind of put that as I'm not going to change it because of the market or what sells. But the point is it sells because it's, that's what people want to read. Right, it's, right. it's exciting. It's, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're plotting whatever. And so, um, so yeah, so um, so I got an agent that was two years ago, two years after my divorce. Um, I finished the book and got an agent, and then it was in a, and of course you think, oh, and I got an agent. Oh, I'm practically it's amazing. there, <laughs> right? I celebrated that night. <laughs> oh my gosh! And, and of course, everybody thinks too that okay. So when's your book coming out? Uh huh. <laughs> it's a whole nother process. So this, you know, the book that I'm writing now is the third one. I mean, the first one, like you said, with you can't be so stuck on it. My agent you know, be, when she asked me if I wanted, um, her to represent me, she, before then she said, 
listen, there's a huge major change you need to make in this first book. And it was, it was a huge revision that she knew cozy mystery editors don't like mm -hmm. a certain thing. And I was like, yes, okay, I'll yep. make it. And not only did it make that book better, it made me a better yes. writer by being able to um, revise. I mean, yeah. you, you, you don't, the, the level of um, what I've learned from that editor I had and from my agent, who's an excellent editor, it, if you fight back on it, um, yeah. it's just, you learn a lot. You learn a lot from people who have been there for a long time and know what they're doing, you know, yeah. and you have I, to trust them. My agent said, you need to change the killer. And I'm like, oh, not my, not major at all. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> but she was 110% right. And I Isn't knew it funny? before she even said it. And I'm like, oh, that's too much work. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So many of the things that, you know, she would put notes in. It's so funny because subconsciously, like you, either I would know it, but I wouldn't know how to do it. So I'd kind of mm -hmm. just let it go, you know? And so, but then when somebody points it out, you're like, okay, well now I got to figure out how to do it. And, you know, and somebody with, again, with confidence who lets you know, and then you get more confidence in what you do. The amount of revision I, I ended up, um, well, I had to revise it within a certain amount of time. So I was like nine hours a day for about three weeks um, straight revising my first book. And which then didn't sell. Um, it wasn't, <laughs> I know, it wasn't right for the target audience, but all the editors that had it, um, you know, said uh, they loved my writing voice and they loved the mystery. It was layered, the characters, you know, drew them in, but they didn't think it was right for the target audience so that it wouldn't sell. Um, so again, another learning experience. I would say my biggest um, advice, if you want to be a writer, is don't don't be bitter. Like, mm. take in everything. Oh, you can be pissed. Yeah. You know, like, I'm <laughs> totally pissed. But, um, but take it as a learning experience. Like, well, okay, then uh, I got to think about my target audience next time. You know, because, because it's true. Who are you writing for? You know, at first you're writing for yourself, but if you want to get published, you're writing for the readers. And so put yeah. your own ego aside a little bit and say, okay, you know, how am I going to write for my readers so that they get the most out of it? So I, I wrote, think, a, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think the best advice I ever got was when you get that feedback, you're going to read it and get really pissed and then put it aside and don't do anything with it. Let it sit for mm -hmm. like two days and then come mm -hmm. back to it. And you really can look at it with clear eyes. Yes, that's a really, that's really good advice because it's, it's true. It's true. And you need to be able to take that in order to grow as a writer. And you always grow as a writer. I right. mean, now that, you know, you can read a lot about um, best selling authors and whatnot, but you know, the ones that I know who I've become friendly with are, you know, authors who get books out, who make a living at it. They're not, you know, they, they don't get the six figures advances mm -hmm. that everybody gets, but these are, you know, most of us. And so, um, they're the ones who still, when they sit down are unsure, right. still feel they need to grow. They're still, I always, you know, when I talk to them, they're always, you know, Oh, I got so-and-so's book. It's a craft book, you know? So, and they've been writing for 10, 15, 20 years. So right. you never stop growing. And like I said, you never reach, there's not a level that you reach that now you're a writer. You're not. You're always a writer. You're just always growing and learning. So, Karina, when uh, can we see your books on the bookshelves? Like, I can't wait to so, walk through the airport and see I, it. <laughs> I can't wait either. Um, so, the first book, and it's a cheese shop mystery uh, series. The first book will be called uh, Cheddar Off Dead. And because uh, they love the little puns. Um, and that will be in the winter of 2021. It will be coming out. And then um, the next year for the next one. So I have three in this so far. And hopefully it will continue on if it's popular. So. Oh, can't wait. So yeah. best-selling author Karina Moss was here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Karina, for sharing your journey, both personally and your writing journey. Thank, Thank you, you so Renee. Much for being with us. Thanks. Bye. Bye.